morning. I'm Pat Matthews, Associate Dean in University College. Welcome to the first talk, talk in our MLA lecture series. Um, the series is supported by a gift from the late Dr. C. Barber Mueller. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are, are on traditional homelands of Native people. We pay respect to elders, both past and present, and we thank them for their hospitality. The Master of Liberal Arts, or MLA program, fosters intellectual breadth through courses that, range, that address a range of issues from different academic perspectives. It's in the same spirit that the MLA lecture series addresses a theme from multiple ac academic disciplines in the hopes of hearing from diverse points of view that provide insights and promote discussion beyond the sum of the talks. Our theme this year is transition. When asked to describe a person or place, we draw upon set conditions. In the case of place, we might describe the location, the population, significant landmarks, ongoing events, concrete descriptors. Transitions, on the other hand, are about moving between those concrete elements. They're about the process of change and adjustment and preparation. Transitions can be something to endure, but they can also be a time of reflection, discovery, and innovation. Each of our speakers this month will provide insights on a particular kind of transition, but also provide a lens through which we consider the transitions that we each face. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. Professor Jonathan Lassos is an internationally renowned scholar in the field of evolutionary biology and is the inaugural holder of the William H. Danforth Distinguished University Professorship. He joined us in 2018 from Harvard University, but Lassos has a long history with WashU, including as a faculty member from 1992 to 2006. Lassos returned to WashU to lead the Living Earth Collaborative, a joint effort among the university, the Missouri Botanical Garden, and the St. Louis Zoo. The Living Earth Collaborative brings together the world's leading scholars in the field of biodiversity to address our ability to sustain life on Earth. Within the biology department, the Lassus Lab focuses on the behavioral and evolutionary ecology of lizards and the study of evolutionary adaptation of wild species to urban landscapes. Losos is the author or co-author, and here according to Google, of 376 publications, and his work has been cited over 28,000 times. Given his work as an evolutionary biologist, Losos is no stranger to transitions that occur in the natural world and the vast possibilities for the way life could exist on Earth in the future. Today, he will speak to us on a more personal transition the one that brought him back to St. Louis to lead the Living Earth Collaborative. His talk is entitled, The Living Earth Collaborative and the Science of Biodiversity, A Personal Journey. Please welcome Jonathan Lassos. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming out on this Saturday morning. Um, I'm delighted to see everyone. And uh, my talk today will be broken into three parts, uh, indicated by the three lines of my title. And I'm going to go actually in reverse order. And um, as we just heard, the, transition, the, the relationship to the transition of, of this uh, year's theme, Transitions, has to do with how I've come to be back here in St. Louis, developing this new partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. But I'm going to begin at the beginning. I think many of you know Ledoux Chapel on Clayton Road. Uh, this is where I went to nursery school. In fact, here I am. And I'm carrying my basket full of dinosaurs. I, uh, I don't mean to brag, but I was legendary in nursery school. I was that kid who knew all the dinosaurs, could pronounce all their names, could correct you and inform you about every single fact about them. So that, that was me. Now, I have to be honest, this is not actually me. This is a historical reenactment. 
This is my good friend Frank, who agreed to pose for this photograph. Um, my wife dressed him up. It is a little disturbing to me that she pictures me wearing a bow tie at age five. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there is a lot of accuracy to this, this uh, photograph. In fact, I still have my basket full of dinosaurs. And I've got a lot new dinosaurs. It's a great time to be a plastic dinosaur collector. But that was me at age five. I then graduated uh, to living reptiles. And here I am, handsome young fellow that I was, at about age 10 in Florida, visiting my great aunt. And I've caught there a little lizard from Florida, it's called, sometimes called the Florida chameleon, or more accurately, the Florida anolis lizard. That's the type of lizard it is. Little did I know back then that this lizard would play a huge role uh, throughout my life. So that's about age 10. And then something, a, a pivotal event in my life occurred, and this was it. Now, who recognizes these fellows? I am sorry to tell you that when I speak to undergraduates today, and I mention Leave it to Beaver, most of them have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, our educational system clearly is in need of an overhaul. Uh, but, all right, we know, we know Wally and the Beave. Does anyone know who this guy is? Anybody? It is Captain Jack. Now, Captain Jack operated an alligator farm in the town that, that the, uh, the Cleavers lived in. And in one episode, Wally and Beaver go visit the alligator farm, and they get the idea of getting their own alligator. And they order one through a mail order thing, and there they are with their little baby alligator. Of course, they didn't tell their parents, and the maid finds out and complains there's an alligator in the basement, and, and you know, I can't, you know, his parents, whose name I'm forgetting, uh, Ward and Ann June think that she's been drinking and all kinds of things go on. And, but uh, anyway, that's the plot of that episode. I highly recommend you go look at it. But the, the point here is I happen to know that at this time in the early 1970s, pet stores here in St. Louis sold not alligators, they were on the endangered species list, but a Central and South American relative of the alligator called the caiman. And I knew that those were for sale. And so I started bugging my mother, can I have a caiman as a pet? Now, I know some of you know my mother. Uh, she's not the sort of woman who likes to say no. So she came up with a different plan. She said, we'll ask, uh, we'll ask a family friend, Charlie Hessel, whom many of you know, the former director of the St. Louis Zoo, uh, we'd ask him what he thought of the idea. And I figured my mom would let him put the kibosh on the plan. So for weeks, I bugged my father. And every day when he came home, I said, did you talk to Mr. Hessel? Did you talk to Mr. Hessel? And one day, he walked in the door and said, I spoke with Mr. Hessel. He says it's a great idea. It was how he got his start in herpetology. So my mom was stuck, and soon I had baby caimans. Um, this, this is a sign. During the winter, we kept them in the basement. This is a kiddie swimming pool. In the summer, we bought a horse trough and put them outside. Now, it's a little known fact that alligators actually make pretty good pets, that if you raise an alligator from a baby, they'll be quite docile. Maybe not affectionate, but they're very safe, and, and they're fine pets. Caimans, not so much. Uh, they are nasty little animals. They bite always, and very quickly I had to wear ski gloves to handle them. Um, so that was, that's just their personality. But they were fascinating little animals. And it really, really sparked my interest in the study of animal behavior in the, in the field of herpetology, which is the study of amphibians and reptiles. And so I got more and more interested. And uh, I do want to point out at this point that uh, I got assistance as I was in high school from a professor here at Washington University, Owen Sexton. I don't know if any of you know him. Sadly, he died a few years ago. He was a wonderful man, a great scientist, and he was very generous with his time for a, a high school student with an interest in herpetology. And so I did a, a high school project, which he helped me with uh, in high school. This is, my, this is uh, me in, the, in my high school senior yearbook. I had a lab full of lizards. I did a little experiment. Now, they were, again, these anolis lizards that I had caught uh, in that earlier photograph, just because they're very common in the pet trade. They were easy to get a bunch of them to do an experiment on. I do want to point out that I was extraordinarily fortunate to have a wonderful set of teachers. I, went, I was in the Ledoux School District, had great science teachers who fostered my interest, great teachers in English and math and so on, some of whom are friends uh, to this day. I don't know if anyone knows Ann Mandelsam or Hank Kaufman or Bill Heide, who sadly died recently. Anyway, I was very fortunate to have a great high school education that prepared me to, um, to, to learn and to study science. 
I also spent that time working at the St. Louis Zoo in the children's zoo during the summers and on weekends, and uh, that was also very uh, influential. So off I went to college with the idea. I'm interested in animals. I'm interested in ecology and animal behavior, and I'll study it and see, what, uh, see how much I really like it. Well, I went to Harvard University as an undergraduate. It turned out that the retiring professor of herpetology there was a man named Ernest Williams, who was the grand old man of anolis lizards. He was the world's expert, and he was the one who really put them on the map academically. And so I ended up working with him and his graduate students. And once again, I did a, a project uh, on, on anolis lizards. Here's a laboratory. I went down to the Dominican Republic to capture them and, and did more research on them and had other adventures in various places. And so the more I got into academics and learning the, the science side of, of animals, the more fascinated I became. So I decided, well, let's just keep on going with this. I'll go to graduate school and see if I really like this. And so I went to the University of California at Berkeley to get a PhD in zoology. And I had all kinds of great adventures. I was in Australia. You'll see my hair is a bit of a theme in these photos. <laughs> this is the wooliest I've ever been. Um, here I am in Costa Rica in the rainforest. In Puerto Rico, the facial hair is gone. Uh, it's back here in Jamaica. We won't discuss what's going on, but these were actually, uh, these were actually field assistants. And um, in my, this photograph notwithstanding, my PhD went very well, and I got more into it. And next thing I know, here I am a professor at Washington University. And I should point out that academia is a great, uh, great in many ways, but one of the downfalls of becoming a, a faculty member or professor is when it becomes time to get a faculty position, you really don't have a say on where you're going to live. Um, you apply for jobs wherever they show up that you, you're qualified for and hope that you get something. And so I couldn't just say, I'm going to come back to St. Louis to be a professor, because I mean, how many universities are there here? You can count them on one hand almost. But by good fortune, a position opened here in the biology department, and I got it. And here I was in 1992. And I have to point out, my love of the blues goes back a long way. You can see I'm, I didn't just jump on the bandwagon last year. Um, but anyway, I was delighted to be back in St. Louis for many reasons, and among, among them was the fact that uh, my family has a long history at Washington University. This is the 1913 Washington University football team, and this is my grandfather, Emanuel Werner, who was, I'm told, not a standout player, but he was on the football team. Uh, my mother, the graduate of the 19. Uh, the class of 1954 and has been involved uh, with the university ever since. My uncle, who many of you may have known, sadly passed away very recently. Charles Werner was a graduate in engineering. In a more recent generation, my niece, Hannah, graduated just last year. And I can tell you from her perspective, she got a, a wonderful education here. And she's off in California now working in their environmental protection agency. So uh, finally, I want to mention my father who has no connection to Washington University, but since he's here in the front row and some of you know him, I would mention him as well. So anyway, here I was, Washington University, a new faculty member, continuing my research. Uh, things continued to go very well. My research took me to all kinds of interesting places, Baja California, New Zealand, Cuba, uh, deserts of Southern California and Africa and so on. And I must say I had a fabulous 14 years as an assistant professor, actually went up the ranks to become a, f a full professor. And Washington University was a wonderful place. Everything was going great. And then Harvard University came knocking. And they were offered me a position. And it was a very difficult uh, decision because I was very, very happy here. It was great, but yet it, it, it was Harvard. And Harvard has one thing that we do not have here, and that is they have a natural history museum. In fact, one of the great university natural history museums in the world the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And so they were offering me not only a tenured faculty position at Harvard, but the opportunity to be the curator of herpetology in this natural history museum. And ultimately, although it took me quite a while to make a decision, I decided this is something that I, I just can't pass up, that if nothing else, the rest of my life, I would wonder, what if? And so I did accept the position and moved up to Cambridge in 2006. And it went, it went great. I did miss St. Louis, but it was a wonderful place to be. And uh, both intellectually and personally, it, it, was a, it was good. And so you might well be asking yourself, well, it's Harvard. There's this natural history museum. What's he doing back in St. Louis? And a couple things. Uh, number one is I must say that I was extraordinarily honored to be, uh, to be offered the 
to be the inaugural William H. Danforth Distinguished University Professor. Um, to be honest, this was, I was told this after I had agreed to come here, and, and so it was just an add-on, but what an incredible honor that is. And it's been a great uh, thrill to get to, to meet Dr. Danforth, who, as you know, is, is still alive and still reasonably active. And anyway, that was a great honor. But the real reason that drew me back here was the new biodiversity center, the Living Earth Collaborative, where I was, uh, I was asked to be the founding director to get this uh, established. And so this was truly an opportunity to do something that uh, I'd never done before. And the Living Earth Collaborative is a biodiversity center, so all about plants and animals, and that is a partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. I'll be talking about that in just a moment. Um, but so that the, in some, so this, this is my history. This is why I'm here. These are the transitions that bring me back to, to help create the Living Earth Collaborative. But you might ask why, in some sense, not only coming back to St. Louis to found this, but lizards have been very good to me. I've spent my life studying them. They're fascinating animals. I'll tell you a little bit more about them in, in a few minutes, and hopefully you'll agree. And I've spent my career mostly, as most science faculty do, doing research on them. Why make the transition out of the laboratory to be an administrative position? Now, I do want to be clear. I'm still doing research. I have a lab here in McDonnell Hall. Um, but a substantial amount of my time is doing something I've never done before, which is running a center and trying to, to build it from the, from the ground up. So why do that? And so this is where I make a transition in the talk to the second part. And we're going to start on, um, sadly, a bit of a somber note. Many of the icon iconic animals that everyone loves, tigers, elephants, and polar bears, by the time your great-grandchildren grow up, they may all be gone. They are all seriously threatened with extinction. It may well be the case that your great-grandchildren, to them, these animals are no different than, than dinosaurs and woolly mammoths things that they know only from museums, as skeletons or stuffed animals, because they no longer exist. In fact, in the last commencement at Washington University last, uh, last May, Chancellor Wrighton identified the loss of biodiversity as one of the three great challenges facing the world today. And he was absolutely right about that. A recent report coming out of the United Nations said that a million species of plants and animals may be threatened with extinction. And in fact, quite regularly, we read bad news that, for example, eight species of birds from Indonesia confirmed to be extinct. Or, in fact, I update every time I give this talk, I update the slide because something new has been reported. In this case, it was just three weeks ago, the Chinese paddlefish, this very large uh, fish from the Yangtze River, is definitely gone. And trends in other, in other way, uh, ways are not good as well. Last year, there was a report that the number of birds in North America has declined by 29% in 40 years. That amounts to 3 billion birds, fewer now than there were just 40 years ago. And what these lines show is different types of birds, and it basically says wherever they're living, this is how much they've decreased. There's only one sort of bird that's doing better, that's the ones in the wetlands, that's ducks. We manage ducks because people like to, to hunt them. Other than that, all types of birds are declining. Uh, a international group that, whose job is to, to monitor nature has found that across the board, different types of plants and animals are endangered. This is the percentage of different of, of birds, of mammals, of coral reefs, the percentage of species that are threatened by extinction. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's a high number and a fairly consistent number for all the different types. Um, and entire ecosystems are threatened. Uh, to be honest, I thought this was the worst news I was going to hear in a long time. This is from The Economist uh, last August, a concern that the Amazon rainforest could actually go away, that there, there are these tremendous fires that are happening every year combined with drying out. Uh, the, the, the forests are drying out because the climate is getting warmer. And, and there was just a fear that they would reach a tipping point where the forest would just collapse. And I thought, I mean, this grabbed a lot of attention. I mean, the cover of The Economist. I thought that was just horrible until just recently what's going on in Australia with the bushfires, which is just, it breaks my heart to, to read about it. And just for context, we read about the fires in the Amazon. 
Uh, at the same time, there have been fires in Southern California. It turns out the amount of area of both of those burned is about the same. The amount of area that has burned already in Australia is eight times as great as what we've been reading about in the Amazon and Southern California. It's, a, it's an area that is almost the size of Costa Rica, the country of Costa Rica, has burned this year, and they're still in the middle of their fire season. Um, I have to say it's a little astonishing that we read all about the bushfires and suddenly it's disappeared from the news. Well, here's your update. It hasn't stopped. In fact, there's a state of emergency in Canberra, the national capital of Australia, right now. So the bushfires are continuing. And it's, it's, it's uh, well, um, enough already. Uh, there are estimates that 500 million animals have died in, this, in these fires. Um, Several species, such as the kangaroo island dunnert, a small rodent-like marsupial, very likely are extinct because their entire known range has burned. And so it's very possible that they're all gone. So, all right, this is dismal. I'm sorry to, to tell you all this, but it is actually quite a bad situation. Nonetheless, I do want to point out that this report that said that there were a million species in danger of extinction, it did, it did say at the bottom, it's not too late that if we act now, many of these extinctions can be averted. But to be very clear, now is the time to act. And in fact, there is some good news that comes along. For example, in Yosemite National Park in California, the red-legged frog had disappeared. But through concerted action to, to take care of the problems that had caused it to disappear, they've been returned to Yosemite and are now becoming much more common. Just an example of that we can uh, reverse the tide. Or in India, they have gone to great efforts to save the tiger, and the population of tigers is now increasing. Or one that I'm sure you are all concerned with, the running buffalo clover, a small flower here, was thought to be extinct, and then it's been found and is actually recovering its population. And going back a little ways, uh, the American eagle and the American alligator, these were the reasons the Endangered Species Act was originally passed, to protect them. Well, we've done such a good job that they no longer are on the Endangered Species Act. A clear example that if we really put our minds to it, we can preserve these species. And so that's the reason for the existence of the Living Earth Collaborative, to try to, to, try to address the issues to help study scientifically all aspects of biodiversity and work towards its preservation. Now, before getting to telling you about the Living Earth Collaborative, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about what biodiversity actually is and how we scientists actually study it. And if you look up biodiversity online or in a dictionary, you'll find there are lots of different definitions, some of them extremely long and complicated. But at its heart, biodiversity is actually a very simple concept. It's simply the variation among living organisms in the world around us. That is the variety of plants and animals and microbes, both the variety within species, as we look in this room, we can see some of that variety, and the differences among different species. As you may have gathered, as I've basically told you, I've spent my life studying lizards, and particularly this type of lizard, the Anolis lizards. And so I'm gonna give you a few examples of research that I have done and people in my lab have done as an example of the variety of different approaches people take to study biodiversity. But the first question is why this particular type of lizard? And the reason is simple, that these lizards, called anoles, because they're in the genus Anolis, occur throughout tropical regions of the New World, throughout from the Amazon on north, through Central America, Caribbean islands, and up into the southeastern United States. And there are actually 400 species of these lizards, and so they're very successful group in terms of their evolutionary diversity. There are many other types of lizards and other organisms that have the same distribution, but there aren't nearly as many species. So this species has been very successful, and so we can study them to try to figure out what, why they are so successful. And then to study particular species to understand how each species has adapted to the particular part of the environment in which it occurs. I do want to point out that Annals are distinguished by two characteristics. One, as you can see here, is the presence of an extensible structure underneath their throat, sometimes called a throat fan or a dewlap that they can stick it in and out, that they use to display to each other. All males have a dewlap. In some species, the female has a dewlap. In other species, uh, she doesn't. The other feature we'll get to in a minute is they have sticky toe pads that allow them to climb up smooth surfaces. Well, the first question we might ask is, what is the evolutionary history of these lizards? How did they 
change through time to come to be like what they are today? Now, to ask that question about the evolutionary history, what sort of data do you think you would want to have? What sort of evidence would inform us? Fossils, yes, that's the, the standard way of, of looking at change through time. Well, unfortunately, little lizards do not fossilize very well, particularly in tropical regions where they live, because basically what happens is they die and they rot too quickly to be, uh, you know, for a fossil, the way a fossil forms is something falls to the ground or falls into a lake, gets covered by sediment or dirt, and then turns into a rock. But little things, particularly in the tropics, rot too fast. And so, in fact, we do not have any traditional fossils um, of that sort. But we do have one sort of fossil, and here are some of them. These, these are baby lizards preserved in amber. Now, has anyone here not seen the movie Jurassic Park? That, that's the response I get. If you recall Jurassic Park, you remember first what amber is. Amber is the sap from a tree that is exuded and solidifies and turns into a hard enough material that it um, remains that way for millions of years. And in the movie, Jurassic Park, perhaps you recall where they get their, so the, the way you get something like this is as the sap is, is oozing out of the tree, some unfortunate animal get, runs over it or lands on it and gets stuck and then gets covered up by more ooze and gets preserved to eternity. Uh, and as you recall in Jurassic Park, they were trying to buy little mosquitoes that had landed in the amber and in theory had dinosaur DNA in their stomachs. So if you recall the movie, the lawyer, you remember the scene where the lawyer, who later gets eaten by the T-Rex in one of my favorite scenes, uh, he takes a raft up to the Dominican Republic to go to the amber mines in the mountains of the Dominican Republic. It turns out those amber mines actually exist. They don't look quite like they did in the movie. And more importantly, uh, the the amber from those mines is not from the Jurassic period. It's actually about 20 million years ago. So the movie should have been called Miocene Park. But that's a different story. Anyway, there's these amber 20 million years old. And a few years ago, I became aware that there were some fossil anolis lizards preserved in amber. So these are 20 million year old specimens. They are really our only snapshot of anoles from the past. And so I decided to try to get hold of as many specimens of these as possible to examine them to see what the diversity of species was like 20 million years ago and how it compares to species today. And so uh, it turned out to take a little bit of sleuthing to find out where these specimens were. Some of them were in natural history museums, such as in New York or in Basel uh, or in London, but many of them were in private hands. And we were able to, to determine that there were 39 specimens around the world that we were aware of and we were able to get hold of 38 of them. And so we had basically all the fossils that anyone knew of. And I won't go into the story, but it was one of the most fun projects I ever, uh, I ever involved in, particularly going to, uh, to Turin, Italy, where the world's greatest collector of amber lived, a lawyer in Turin who had 21 of the 38 pieces he owned himself. And he was willing to lend them to me, um, but I couldn't, I had to go pick them up myself because he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't send them through the mail, understandably enough. And I could not bring them to the United States because he was afraid, I don't really understand completely, that if they came through customs in the US, we would never let them go back out. I don't know why, but so we had to find a place. But what we wanted to do with them is we wanted to put them through a CAT scanner, just like some of you have been through, to see the intricate internal details. So we had to fly them to London. I had to fly them to London and go to the Natural History Museum where they had such a CAT scanner get them scanned, then return them to Turin. Oh, and the other thing about it is that uh, there were insurance policies that were purchased for these, because they have some value, that specified that to carry these, they had to be hand carried on the airplane, and that you had to fly first class. And <laughs> so, I mean, what could I do? It was, it was in the insurance policy. Um, anyway, this was a lot of fun. We, we CAT scanned these specimens, and we never really knew what we would find inside. This is a specimen from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And the first thing we see is that it's been dropped and glued back together. You can see there's a break there in the middle of the animal. But aside from that, this is a perfect specimen. We can see every single bone. We can take careful measurements and compare them to species living today. 
Uh, this is another specimen from, uh, from a German museum. The interesting thing here is the middle was all gone. Presumably what happened is that all the bacteria in the guts rotted away the middle before they finally died out when it was covered with amber. But still, we could see lots of the other material. Now here's one, we could see that there's a lizard in there. We could see the tail and the legs, but we really couldn't see most of it. But the CAT scan showed us everything. And so this was just fabulously exciting, and we were able to get detailed measurements. We determined that there were at least four different species that we were looking at minimally among these 38 specimens. And it turns out as well that they weren't very different from those species living today, that very likely they were the same species or their direct descendants. And so what this indicates is that by 20 million years ago, the diversity of species that we see today had pretty much already existed. So this was a, a great glimpse into at least a little window of the evolutionary past of these lizards. Now the other approach that people take today to understand the evolutionary past is to sequence species DNA and increasingly to sequence their entire genomes. And then by comparing the genomes of different species, you can infer their evolutionary relationships with the basic idea being that species that are more similar in their genes probably more recently diverged from a common ancestor, whereas ones that are very different, probably it was a long time ago they went their different way. And in that, in that way, you can infer the evolutionary tree of living species. And so we've been doing a lot of that right now. In fact, we were the first group to uh, sequence the genome, the entire genome of a reptile, and we have a massive project underway now that will tell us a lot about how the different species evolved. Now, a second approach is understanding how species are adapted to where they live. And one of the things I haven't told you about is that the species do vary in how long their legs are, from very long-legged ones to very stumpy-legged ones, how big their toe pads are, and various other characteristics. And so we'd like to know, are these differences in anatomy, uh, are they a part of how they adapt to where they live? And one question that we would have is, well, what difference does it make to a, live, a lizard how long your legs are or how big your toe pads? And so to ask that question, we basically uh, under, put them through a set of trials that we call Lizard Olympics. And so, for example, we get them to jump. This is something called a force platform. And so we put the lizard on the force platform, we tap it on the tail, and when everything goes well, he just launches himself into space. And this uh, piece of equipment can very precisely measure how much force the lizard is generating as it pushes off. And then if we film the trajectory, we can do some basic physics and combine force plus trajectory and see how far they can jump. And then we can try to see if that correlates with how long their legs are or how big their muscles are or so on. This is a lizard racetrack. And for that, we put the lizard at the bottom, give him a poke. If all goes well, he goes running up to the top. There are little infrared beams every foot or so, and he breaks the beams, and that tells us how fast they can run. And again, we ask, is that related to how long their legs are, or, and so on. And so in this way, we get an understanding how all of this anatomical variation actually matters to what the lizards could do. And then we go into the field and study what they actually are doing, and in that way, we can get a sense of how different species have adapted to living in different places. We'll come back to that idea in just a moment. Another question concerns this throat structure I told you that males have that they use to display to each other. And it, it turns out that species vary greatly in the size of their dewlap, in the color, in the patterns, and so on. And what we'd really like to know is what are they telling each other when they make these displays? What difference does it make how big the dewlap is or how vigorously they stick it out? Well, to, do, to test that idea, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory developed a lizard robot that would display just like a real lizard, and then you can, of course, change how fast it displays, how big its dewlap is, and so on. But the big question, of course, is, is a lizard going to be fooled by a robot? Well, let's take a look. Here's the real lizard down here. That's the robot up there. He's sticking his dewlap out, and this guy's pretty perturbed. And sure enough, he jumps right up and attacks them. And so it turns out the lizards will respond to these robots which lets us do all kinds of manipulative experiments, changing the stimulus to see what, how they respond. So now I want to tell you two last stories about the research that we've done in a little more detail. And the first one gets back to how species are adapted to their environment. One trend across all of these lizards 
is that species that live on broad surfaces like tree trunks tend to have very long legs, whereas ones that use narrow surfaces like twigs have short legs. Our functional studies, let us explain why that is, that on a broad surface, species with long legs can run faster and can jump farther. And so it makes sense that it makes them better fit to, to capture prey and elude predators and so on. On a narrow surface, however, short-legged ones are much more agile. That you put a long-legged lizard on a narrow surface and it will fall right off. As soon as it starts to run, they just miss as they're grabbing and they topple off. And so it, we have a, a good understanding, we think, of how they're adapted. Uh, yet, this is all really a correlation. You know, broad surfaces, long legs, narrow surfaces, short, short legs. As we all know, correlation does not prove causation. What we would like to do is to use the gold standard of the scientific method and actually do an experiment to see uh, whether we can test this idea. But of course, we're talking about evolution. And as everyone knows, evolution takes forever to occur. So how could you do an experiment? Well, it turns out it doesn't take forever. That in the last 20 or 30 years, we've come to realize that when conditions change, when natural selection is strong, evolution can occur very rapidly. In fact, we see it all around us with pests evolving resistance to pesticides and herbicides and so on. And of course, microbes evolving resistance to our drugs. That's what resistance to antibiotics is all about. But we've come to realize that it's pervasive in nature that evolution occurs much more rapidly than we used to think was possible. What that means as a corollary is that we can actually do experiments on evolution, alter conditions, and, think, and expect that we might get a result within a couple of years. And so, so to my mind, this is one of the most exciting areas, certainly in, in evolutionary biology, but I, I would argue in all of biology or even all of science, that we can actually do experiments in the field on evolution. And so that's just what we've done. What we did in this case is we took some lizards from an island in the background, this is in the Bahamas, where they lived in a forest, and they, lived, and they used big trees, and they had long legs, just as we would, would expect. And we transplanted them to these very tiny little islands that had nothing but scrubby vegetation, just a bunch of little bushes. And so forced them to use very narrow surfaces. And so our prediction was that if our understanding was correct, that over time they would evolve to have shorter legs to adapt to living in their new conditions. And here's what we found. Over the course of just three years, this is how long their legs are, you can see all seven populations evolve shorter legs, just as we predicted. And so we had shown that, in fact, they were adapting, they were evolving over a very short period of time in the predicted direction. Now, the one thing I would add is this type of work is continuing, and now with our, our ability to sequence the genomes, we're hot on the trail of actually finding the genes that regulate how long their legs are, and we hope before too long to actually show at the genetic level the changes that have occurred that have led to having shorter legs. But that, you'll have to come back in a little, in a few years to get the result from that. Uh, I want to tell you one last story about research, and this is, along with the amber lizards, my favorite project ever. And it has to do with this peculiar lizard from Ecuador called the horned anole. And it's called that because it has a horn on its anole, very unusual, on its nose. It's got a horn right there, very unusual. This is a species that was discovered in 1954. It's in the mountains of Ecuador on the Pacific side at about 4,500 feet in the cloud forest. And it was discovered and two male specimens were found. And th so these scientists wrote a paper on it. And then over the next 10 years, four more specimens were found. So we had six specimens, interestingly, all males. And then the years started to go by. No more horned anoles were found we began to think that the species might be extinct. It was only known from a very small area in Ecuador. Maybe something had happened, and they'd gone away. And then in 2005, this. Now, I'm a little embarrassed as a herpetologist to tell you this, but this specimen, living specimen, was found by a bunch of bird watchers. Very embarrassing. They were on a nature tour in the Andes of Ecuador. They were driving their minibus. And there one was in the middle of the road. And so they stopped, got out, saw it, picked it up, took a picture. It's not clear that they knew what they had found, uh, but they put the picture on the internet, and some of us who did know its significance saw that and said, the horned anole still lives. Very exciting. Uh, 
Of course, this begs the question, what was the arboreal lizard doing crossing the road? <laughs> we don't know the answer to that. So a colleague of mine from the University of New Mexico is a specialist on finding hard-to-find lizards. And he went down there to see if he could, he could find them. And he knew that the, the trick to finding them, these are lizards that are active during the day. At least we presume, because all anoles are active during the day. The trick is not to go looking for them during the day, but to go looking for them at night. Because what these lizards generally do is they sleep in the trees. What they will do is they will get to the end of a branch and sleep on the very end of the twigs or on a leaf in a very, uh, at the very end of, of, of the vegetation. And the reason they do that is that if anything is coming to eat them, like a snake or a rat, it will cause the, the branch to vibrate. They will wake up and jump off and be safe. A great strategy, except it doesn't work for bipedal organisms with flashlights. And so what you do is you go out with a really powerful flashlight and look for this tiny lizard on the end of a branch. And uh, you have to be really good to know what you're looking for because they're small and they're often way up in the tree. But in fact, they were there. That Steve Poe and his team found them in the forest there. He said they, they slept 30 feet up, but they found them. Now, at this point, I, so the species actually, it's in a small area, but it's not that rare where it occurs. These guys did answer the, the burning question that is probably on all of your minds, which is, did, does a female exist? Well, presumably a female does exist. Does she have a horn? We didn't know. We had never seen a female before. So I like to ask people when I get to this point, who thinks the female horned anole has a horn? Anybody? A few people? Yes, don't be shy. Who thinks the female horned anole doesn't have a horn? Well, that's a common, common about three quarters of people say no, no horn. Well, we now know the answer to this question. The female horned anole does not have a horn. Here she is. She's hornless, she's green, she's smaller than the male. Here two of them are together. Oh, it's a, it's a, uh, a phenomenon called sexual dimorphism. And we presume from this that the horn had something to do with reproduction, with courtship or in some other way. That's why males have the horn and females don't. But we didn't know. In fact, Steve Poe's team was great at finding lizards, but the only thing they could tell, they spent all their time out at night. They literally would be out all night looking for lizards. Then they'd come back, they'd sleep, they'd eat, do whatever else has to be done. So they couldn't tell us anything about their biology other than where they sleep. But now that we knew where they were and how to find them, I then took, led a team of uh, scientists to go and try to find them during the day to observe their behavior, where they live, what they do, and particularly what the horn is all about. So we went back to the very same place here. Steve told us exactly where, he, where to go. We went out at night with our flashlights. Yep, there they are. They're here, all right, this is gonna be easy. Went back, went to sleep, got up, went back there the next morning, could not find a single one. And we're good lizard finders. And we were there all day with our binoculars looking around, could not find a single one. That night we went to a different place, again found a lot of them, went back again the following day, again couldn't find, find one at all. So we realized what we had to do was we had to go out at night, find them, tie a ribbon around each tree, then go to sleep for a couple of hours, then get back before dawn while they're still sleeping, and basically follow them as they wake up and go about their, their business. And that's what we did, and it worked. And so we were able to finally get the first information, the first time anyone had ever paid attention to these guys and learned about what they did. And we found out why they were so hard to find? And the answer is simply, they're extremely well camouflaged. Imagine this against a dappled yellow and, and green background, particularly in bamboo, where we often found them. They, they just blend right in. And this is how they walk. They kind of walk like this. Very slow. So you're not going to pick it up out of the corner of your eye because it just seems like something's swaying back and forth. In fact, one time I was watching one of my, in my binoculars and I sneezed. And, well, and then I couldn't find it. And I knew more or less where it was. I couldn't find it. So they're incredibly well camouflaged and very cryptic in their behavior. In fact, so much so that the local people had never, never seen them either. This was news to them. Usually local people know their plants and animals extremely well. But these guys are like, what the heck is that? So we were able to get a lot of data on how they move, what they eat, where they live, when they're active, uh, all kinds of great data. But of course, what we were really interested in 
is what the horn was all about. Now, I was picturing, you know, a guy like this coming on up to another guy and, you know, having a big sword fight, if you will, or a horn fight where they push each other and eventually one pushes one off. Some lizards are known to do that. Now, take a look at this video of one we were watching. Did you see that? I'm going to play it again. Watch its horn as it hits the leaf. The horn bends right over. There's no stiffness whatsoever. So clearly, they can't be fighting with each other if there's no stiffness. In fact, we would put them in a plastic bag, and they would run into the plastic bag, and the horn would bend right over. So they're not having horn fights. That idea is out. At the same time, we saw some, some of our animals that we caught look like this. I mean, look at this poor loser with a floppy horn. What female is going to go for him? Uh, I, I felt really sorry for this guy. Uh, but this is a trial in which we, were gonna, we wanted to see how they eat. And so we've caught this guy. We put him on a branch, and we're going to feed him a grasshopper, which is going to climb up from the bottom. So watch what happens. You can see he starts his horn. It's just like that. Here comes the grasshopper. He's about to eat it. And I watch the horn right now. He's lifted his horn up 45 degrees. They can move their horns. This was stunning news to the lizard anatomy world. Uh, because lizards do not have muscles on the tips of their nose. I mean, how do they do that? We still don't know. We think it must be some sort of hydrostatic thing, but, but we don't know the answer. So they can move their horns. They aren't fighting with them. That's as far as our project went. However, we were working with some Ecuadorian scientists from Quito, the capital, who took some specimens back with them to the university, put them in terraria, and observed them there. And they found out that the males that have a ritualized behavior, that when a, a male, two males are fighting, Eventually, one will just become submissive and go like this, and the other one will kind of touch him with his horn, and that somehow that means, I don't know what it means, but that's what they do. And the male, when, when courting the female, kind of flourishes the horn in front of her. Now, why all these things evolved, why they do that, we have no idea, but at least that is what they're doing with their horns. Well, there's a broader point. So to me, as I said, this was just very rewarding because before our work, we knew basically nothing about these lizards except where they slept. And now we have some general understanding of their natural history. There's a lot more to learn, but we now know a fair amount about them. So this is an important in a broader sense because I think many people think that we've been studying nature for centuries now, that we basically know most of what there is to know. That you can buy the field guide to birds from around here, and it would suggest that what is there to know about a cardinal or a grosbeak or whatever. The reality is that even many of these bird species many aspects of their biology we don't know. In fact, there are all kinds of interesting discoveries all the time. A few years ago, I wrote a book on these lizards, the anoles. As you'll remember, there were 400 species of them. At that time, and this is now 10 years old, my book had 1,400 references, 1,400 scientific papers. So these lizards have been studied to an extraordinary degree. And so I assumed, as I, I was going to read the whole literature, that we would know everything there was to know. The fact is, most species of these lizards, I would say about 350 of them, we essentially know nothing about their biology. We know where they live, more or less, just geographically, maybe how big they are, and that's about it. I would say there are maybe 10 species that we, even, that we know a lot about, and even then, there are lots of gaps in our knowledge. The point is that much of the natural world is still unknown, that we're still very much in an age of discovery of the, of the diversity of the biological world around us. And, I mean, this information is, a, is of interest not just for curiosity's sake, but in, this, in these times increasingly because species are threatened by all the different ways that we are changing the world. Of course, deforestation is a dramatic effect, but the climate is changing, it's getting warmer, the weather patterns are changing, we're putting chemicals into the environment, we're introducing new species that didn't occur, many different changes. If we want to try to figure out how to help species, well, the first thing we need to know is, what are their needs? What are their lives like? And so now more than ever, it is crucial that we continue to gather information on the basic biology of the world's species. And that, of course, is the segue to the last part of the talk about the Living Earth Collaborative, this new partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. I don't think I need to spend much time talking about these great institutions. We all know the Missouri Botanical Garden. What you may not know is that it is generally considered to be one of the three great botanical gardens in the world. 
the other two being in New York and London. And they have that reputation not just for the beautiful grounds, but for what goes on behind the scenes. At the Missouri Botanical Garden, they have 45 PhD researchers on staff. It's one of the great botanical institutions of scholarship in the world. Every year, people, uh, their scientists go around the world, they collect new sp specimens, and every year they describe 200 to 250 new species not previously known. They have an herbarium, which is essentially a plant museum, that has 7 million specimens in it. It is the largest plant herbarium in the world. So the Missouri Botanical Garden is, as I said, one of the great institutions for botanical research and knowledge. We all know the St. Louis Zoo and what a wonderful place it is. It keeps on getting better with new exhibits. Now they've just bought this North Campus, which in a few years should be a spectacular new uh, institution. Uh, but what you may not know is what goes on behind the scenes in their research and conservation efforts. Many of them are in what's called the Wild Care Institute, which is only about 15 years old now, but it has these centers listed here that work around the world to, preserve, to study and preserve and conserve nature. And you can see the different centers. They range from Forest Park, very locally, or studying hellbenders, that's an endangered species of salamander, here in Missouri, to working around the world, in Africa, in Madagascar, Peru, and so on. And in fact, just in the last year, they've opened up another five centers. So it is a spectacular program conserving species. And I should say, although some of the work occurs at the zoo itself, breeding endangered species or learning about them, most of the, that work occurs out in, in the field in these various places. So the zoo is also a great, a great center for conservation and research as well. And then there's Washington University, which has a long and rich history of, of biodiversity research. Now, you'd expect it to occur in biology or in anthropology, which is the building we're in here, where the people who study monkeys and human evolution occur. But in fact, there's also biodiversity researchers basically scattered throughout the university in philosophy, in political science. There's a woman in the business school who leads a trip every year to Madagascar, taking a bunch of undergraduates and business school students to work on issues around environmental sustainability and how that relates to, to nature. Uh, the medical school has lots of labs doing basic biodiversity research. Engineering school, surprisingly, has some people doing this. In social work, there's a woman who studies uh, rural development in northern Kenya. And one of the projects she works on is developing an ecotourism lodge for the local people to get the benefits of tourism and how that can help uh, develop those communities. But of course, that has obvious implications for biodiversity as well. We also have in landscape architecture a number of people working on the city of the future in which nature is an integral part. And finally, our Tyson Research Center, which in the last few years has just blossomed into a fabulous facility where researchers from across the country come to do research on forest ecosystems, particularly forest ecosystems at the urban, at the city nature interface, where Tyson is at out 44, just past where St. Louis, uh, the city ends. So the idea of the Living Earth Collaborative, we have all these, uh, these three institutions with great strengths in biodiversity, and essentially the idea is to have them uh, work together. It, it sounds kind of trite in a way, but it's to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. As so often is the case, even though we're only we're in the same city, there hasn't been that much interaction and collaboration. There's been some, but we could do a lot more. And that's the goal of the Living Earth Collaborative, is to build bridges and to do things by, by combining forces that haven't been done already. Now, you might ask, well, why did the university get involved in this? And um, you know, why it's, it, it's a great, uh, it's a great enterprise, but it's expensive, and the university has so many resources. What was the interest of that? Well, I asked, uh, I asked Chancellor Wrighton, who was, who was key in getting this set up, where he got the idea of this three-way partnership that, with the university and the zoo and the garden. And his, his answer, I think, was very telling. He said, you know, I, Mark Wrighton, as Chancellor of Washington University, I can say we're going to make our medical school the best in the country. But in reality, every major city has a great medical school. They're all striving for excellence. You can't just by fiat say we're going to be the best. But here in St. Louis, we have something that is almost unique, and that is that we have a great university, a great botanical garden, and a great zoo, all in the same city, in fact, all within about a three-mile radius of each other. 
And there's basically almost nowhere else in the world that can say that. And so when we, this is something that is important, that is timely, that we here at Washington University can do, that our peer institutions, the Vanderbilts, the Dukes, the Penns, even places like Harvard and Yale, they can't do this. So here we can take advantage of what St. Louis has to offer and do something important that will stand out. And, um, and here's my map just showing that. And the chancellor is absolutely right. We could you know, quibble about what constitutes greatness, but there's really only one city, certainly in the United States, perhaps in the world, that has such a constellation of institutions, and that's New York City. But in New York City, they're an hour apart from each other, and we, we all know what New York is like. Whereas here, at the most, we're, what, 12 minutes from the Botanical Garden. So that was what the Chancellor saw. And so that is how the Living Earth Collaborative got established, and I'd like to just spend the last few minutes talking about what we're actually going to be doing, and what we are doing. The, the Collaborative began January 1st of 2018, so we're now two years old. Um, and so basically we're going to be working to enhance, I and mean, this is perhaps obvious, research, conservation, and education. And in terms of education, in particular, we have you know, all these undergraduates who many of them are quite interested in nature and the environment. We're going to give them the opportunity to take advantage of the expertise and the institutions we have. And we've already started to do this. This is a class that I've been teaching for freshmen the last two years. Here the class is in the Climatron being led around by uh, this expert on plant uh, evolution, what they do is see the diversity of trees in the Climatron and then take little leaf samples, take them back to the lab and extract DNA as part of an ongoing study to see the diversity of, of genetic, genetics in these different species in the Climatron. There they are getting up close uh, at the at big cat country with a tiger. Here we are at the insectarium with a beetle. Uh, and of course, the idea of this class, these are first semester freshmen. This was to grab them, the, you know, the moment they've come to college, show them the great opportunities, the great, uh, see what is done at these institutions. And with the subtext is you can get involved. There's all kinds of ways that you can if you're interested. And so far, I think it's been a, a, great, a great success. We've also been working on, on internships to get the students working at these institutions and other ones in the St. Louis area, of which we have many. Um, either during the semester or during the summer, and also getting them involved in research projects. And speaking of projects, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about some of the projects that we have underway. And essentially, we have two approaches to developing new projects. One is what I call major initiatives. And the idea, this is kind of top down, by having conversations with the leaders at the three institutions of what areas do we have does it make sense to invest some resources uh, because we have a lot of overlap in expertise? And that area could be a geographic area, it could be a type of plant or animal, or it could be a conceptual area. And in thinking about this, the obvious first choice was Madagascar, because this is the one place that the zoo and the garden have worked together closely in the past. Washington University has long had a history of doing research in Madagascar, and there are in fact a number of great young professors very interested in working in Madagascar. It was an obvious place where we could join forces to, uh, to try to get something important done. Now, I don't know how much any of you know about Madagascar. I don't know, has anyone seen the movie Madagascar? Uh, it turns out, surprisingly, this movie was almost entirely inaccurate. Uh, but not entirely, because it turns out there is this diversity of animals called lemurs that are only found in Madagascar. And in fact, Madagascar has many species that are only found there, because Madagascar split off from Africa about 80 to 100 million years ago, and so all the species there have been evolving in isolation ever since. So it's got a unique fauna and flora, and for this reason, it's sometime ca sometimes called by scientists the eighth continent due to its, uh, its great diversity. But sadly, uh, Madagascar has huge problems. It's one of the saddest countries in the world. It's it, on the bottom of all indicators in terms of uh, economic development and uh, the rates of de... It's on the top of the things you don't want to be on top of. Deforestation, they've lost 90% of their forest already. Uh, they had bubonic plague last year. They have all kinds of illnesses. Uh, it, it's a very sad place. And so it's an area where great biological diversity and great peril. And so we've developed a project to work on focus on lemurs and figuring out how can we study the lemurs to learn more about them and use that knowledge to identify areas that can be protected 
that the lemurs can be protected in. And the good news is if you protect areas for lemurs, you're protecting everything else that lives in those areas as well. And so this was the obvious first step. And we've actually got a project off the ground. We were very fortunate to get a half a million dollar donation to get this project going. And it's, uh, in fact, two faculty members in this department, in this building, Macmillan Hall, are hiring their staff right now. And the project will begin later this spring. I think it will, could make a major impact on the ability to conserve Madagascar's uh, biological di uh, diversity. Now, in addition, there are some other areas we are just thinking about for major initiatives. One of them has to do with wild canids. Canids are dogs and their relatives, foxes, wolves, coyotes, and so on. It turns out here in St. Louis, we have the Endangered Wolf Center. Some of the, you may know it. It's based out at Tyson, it's Tyson Research Center, but it's not part of the university. It is the world's leading breeder of endangered wolves for reintroduction into the wild. So we have them. We have some faculty at Wash U who specialize in canids. And of course, we have the zoo, which has great interest in canids. Uh, they've just started one of their new centers, wild care centers, on the painted dog in Africa. So, we're, so here's just some diversity of canids. We're figuring out exactly what we might do about canids. It may involve uh, the North Campus facility just being developed. Uh, they may have canids out there, and they're actually natural canids on that property, foxes and coyotes and others. Another topic of great interest is urban biodiversity. Increasingly, biologists are interested in the diversity that occurs right around us. Some of that diversity is of actual conservation value, but more importantly, this is the diversity that people interact with. This is the nature that many people see, particularly people who don't have the opportunity to go out to Africa or other places. We have a lot of expertise, a lot of interest in many different aspects of urban biodiversity. Just to give you one example, you may not know this, but the number of species of bees recorded in the city of St. Louis is the highest for any city in the world. Now, two things about that. One is, it's a little bit sad, it's because there are all these empty lots with all the weeds growing up, uh, attracts bees. But the other reason is that we've actually gone out and counted them. I suspect that there are places in who knows, Singapore, Nairobi, that if they actually counted their bees, they might have more because they're in the tropics. But the fact is, we've got a lot of bees, and we've got people studying them and figuring out how can we convert all this open land into uh, natural areas that are beneficial for nature and yet are good for the people living around them. So more generally, a lot of interest in urban biodiversity. This is an area that I'm sure we're going to start working on before long. The other thing we do is what are called seed grants. And they're just what the name implies. The idea is to fund a project, to plant a seed, to see if it can get going. And the idea is we'll give up to $30,000 to researchers. They can start the project. And then the hope is that they'll, the project will they'll be able to go get funding from federal agencies or uh, nonprofit agencies or whatever. And so the projects have to be new and collaborative across institutions. And we had two rounds of these seed grants. We're about to announce the third competition. And I have to say I've been thrilled at the diversity of projects that we have gotten. So for example, researchers at the zoo and the botanical garden are working on, conservation, on biodiversity in the forests of, South, of Ecuador, one of the richest places in the world. Or people at the Genome Center at Washington University working with uh, scientists at St. Louis University who are trying to be very inclusive of including the other institutions in St. Louis besides the three partner institutions. They're working on trying to understand how fish can live in streams in the city. If you think about the River de Pere or some of the creeks that go through here, there are actually fish living there. But they experience all kinds of insults, so all the salt that gets washed into the, into the rivers during the streams during the winter, all the chemicals. Often, uh, often the trees have been cut down, so they're much hotter than they would be otherwise. How do these fish actually survive? Well, the approach here is to capture some fish in the city and to look at their DNA and compare that to the same species 50 miles out, I don't know where, where out in the rural areas, to look for genetic in differences indicating that they have adapted to li living in the city. Another project uh, headed by people here in anthropology and over in earth and planetary sciences is trying to understand the history, the climate history in the rainforest in Costa Rica. It turns out we don't have a good grasp on how the climate has changed in rainforests over the last 20,000 years. And of course, if we want to know how rainforests are going to change in the future, as climate changes, it would be good to know how they've responded in the past. But to do that, you need to have a record of climate change. Well, these researchers have the idea that there are caves full of bats. And as you know what bats do in caves, they poop. And so there are these huge 
layers of guano this high or higher, thousands of years of bat poop. And I'm sorry to get technical with my jargon. So what they have done is they go to these caves, they take some undergraduates, they all wear protective gear, and they take a core of the guano going down to the bottom. So a thousand, multi-thousand year record. And then by looking at the chemical signature in the guano, they can make inferences about how wet it was and what the temperature was. I can't explain to you the chemistry beyond it, behind it, but that's what they're trying to do. It's never been done before. It might not work, but if it does, it can radically change our understanding of the history of, of rainforests. So here's just a list of some of the other projects. I'm not going to go through them all in any detail, but you can see they're as diverse as what role parasites play in the ecosystem. To um, this one here is looking at Shaw Nature Reserve, where they're trying to reestablish new uh, endangered species of plants and trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, looking at the genetic diversity of wild grapes, new species of subspecies of monkeys in Africa, and so on. So a very diverse set of projects. That was 2018. In 2019, we have another set of projects, again, very diverse. And what I'm, I'm not going to go through these, but what I'm particularly thrilled about is the people at Washington University involved in these projects. That, as you can see, we've got people from almost every school at Washington University. We've got the Brown School, used to be Brown School of Social Work. We've got the Sam Fox School of Design, Engineering, the Med School. The only school we don't have is the law school and the and U College. Uh, law school, I would really like to get some people we're having conversations. But the, good, the point here is, to my mind, if 10 years from now, the only people at Washington University involved in the collaborative were people in arts and sciences, the biologists and the anthropologists, I would be disappointed. And because that's the, what the university brings to this partnership is the great breadth of knowledge spanning all of the disciplines. And so I'm thrilled to see that we actually are getting involvement from across the university. I will say that we are, as I say, we're about to have our next round of seed grants, and I'm really looking forward to see what kind of proposals we get. The last thing I'm going to tell you about is that the last thing we've done is we've hired four postdoctoral fellows. They were hired specifically, they had, to, they had to write proposals that involved establishing new collaborations across the institutions, bringing their own expertise. And uh, we, sp we intentionally chose people who are go-getters, who just can't help themselves that they reach out and make new connections and create new programs and so on. And in my experience, postdoctoral students, I should say, for those of you who don't know, the, in academia, the stage between getting your PhD and getting a faculty position, you do what's called a postdoctoral fellowship. And it's actually a very tough time to be a postdoc these days because we're producing many more PhDs than we have faculty positions for. So it's really hard, it's very competitive. It's tough for them, but it's great if you're hiring because there's all kinds of people looking for a job for a postdoctoral fellowship, and they are spectacular. And we were able to get the cream of the crop, these four fabulous scientists who not only are, have great scientific credentials, but as I said, they're just the sort of people who reach out and create new programs. In fact, one of them, Brett Seymour, the Grossman Family Postdoctoral Fellow, his research has already, I uh, had a paper come out a couple months ago that was in the media around the world about the effect of light pollution, about basically how light it is at night because of all the lights in cities, basically messing up uh, insects and how that affects uh, ecosystems and so on. So anyway, we have these four postdocs. They just arrived in September. We're, we've just made another offer for a no, new set of four postdocs. These are two-year fellowships, so we'd have a standing crop of eight, and uh, I expect great things from them. Well, that is what is going on in the Living Earth Collaborative. Two years in, I'm very happy what we've uh, got going so far. I think we've got a lot of different programs going. And now the question, of course, is what are we going to accomplish? And I, I'm very hopeful. We had a few accomplishments already. But I would say check back in three or five years, and we'll see what, what this all amounts to. So thank you very much for coming out today. For questions, um, and I'll pass the microphone around. Um, I, I'm not in this field or anything, but uh, you know, with Madagascar, um, I'm curious whether the the perils that you mentioned are causing the biodiversity, because you know, for species to evolve, they need they need environmental pressure or gradients or something like that. 
And is that true, you know, that, that um, is that true, first of all? And, and the second question is, is there a net loss of biodiversity? You know, species are going extinct, but then you also mentioned that a lot of the research fellows at the zoo are finding new species. So is there a net loss, net gain? Uh, all right, so a couple of different questions. Uh, the first question was, I think, as humans are messing things up, is that an impetus for species? Is that why there is so much diversity? That, was that the question? Well, not just humans, but any sort of environmental uh, pressure. Yes, yeah, so um, as <clears throat> the earlier part of the talk, as I, I mentioned, we now know that evolution can occur very rapidly when conditions change. And so, in fact, some of the areas that are the richest in the world are probably because there is a lot of changing environments. So that is certainly the case. And it's also the case that species going extinct, that occurs, has occurred naturally. I think the, the issue is the pace at which we're changing the environment and the extent to which much of the environment is being rendered just not usable for most species. So, for example, in Madagascar, of which much was forested until 1,000 to 2,000 years ago, uh, most of that forest has, has been cut down and replaced by, well, agricultural fields in some cases. But the other problem is that the forest, when it's cut down, the nutrients leach out of the soil. So a lot of it is, there's, they, they can grow crops for a few years, and then there's nothing. Uh, and so, so it is not, it is not in the near term leading to a, re, a replenishment of uh, species. It's mostly just a net loss where the, the area is becoming just not usable by many species. Now it is true probably that over the long span of time, what we're doing will lead to the production of new species. For example, when you have, say, a species that used to occur over North, all of North America, and if it gets then restricted to national parks, given enough time, a population of the same species in those parks may turn into multiple different species. That's how new species arrive, arise in isolation. But that takes a long time. The, the development of new species is a much longer process. Or put another way, uh, there have been major extinction events in Earth's geological history. They're what are called mass, extinction, mass extinctions. There have been five of them. Life has bounced back each time, but it takes about five to 10 million years. And you know, unless we completely destroy the planet, probably five to 10 million years ago, life will have rebounded. Um, but that's a long time from that. Uh, the other question was, I've forgotten what the other question, net gain or net loss? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's, I thought you were gonna actually ask a slightly different question. We are discovering new species, um, but these are not, these are species that were always there. And so, um, you know, the number that we know of is increasing even as the number that we know have disappeared uh, is also increasing. Uh, some people have argued, that the other thing we are doing though is we are moving species around with all the invasive species that we bring in around the world. There are actually many places that have more species than they used to. Uh, because the new species we have brought in have more than compensated numerically for the ones that have disappeared. And so some people have argued, what's the problem? The, the species number isn't changing. The difference is that it's the same species. Uh, you have rats and pigeons and, uh, and the same weeds everywhere. So any given space may have a bunch of species, but we're losing the distinctiveness, the species that were only found in Madagascar or in Australia or so on. So we're homogenizing the world and basically filling it up with the species that can top, do well in our, in our uh, surroundings. Those are both good points. In the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that some species were almost extinct and they came back. Yes. Uh, what is it that facilitates that coming back? Well, there's a couple things. In, in many cases, it's because we have worked to reverse the problem that was causing them to disappear. For example, the red-legged frog in Yosemite uh, a major, two major problems, they breed in water, they have tadpoles, as many frogs. Uh, trout introduced to those waters ate all the tadpoles. Um, that, that the trout did, didn't used to occur in these high mountain uh, lakes. And so by getting rid of the trout in some of those lakes, the frogs were put back there, they were able to reproduce, and also getting rid of some of the water pollution. Or with the uh, American eagle, it turns out it was DDT, that we use DDT to spray on insects, it, it causes, uh, 
birds of prey to have very thin eggs that when the female sits on them, they would just break. We've gotten rid of the DDT in the environment, and now they're able, and we've also protected them from being shot. And with American alligators, it was just um, stopping the over, over harvesting of them for skins. So in a lot of cases, it's, um, it's that we just stopped doing what was harming them. In some cases, it may well be that species have evolved to, to be able to live around us. And one of the great questions that I and my colleagues are interested in is, in what circumstances or how often can species actually evolve to compensate for the changes that are occurring? As the world gets warmer, will they be able to live in warmer conditions? My guess is that a, some of them will, that evolution will save the day, but probably not for most species uh, because the threats are just so dire. And in many cases, the populations have been reduced to such small size, they just don't have the, the capacity to evolve quickly enough. Sorry, you had to walk so far. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Losos, for this. I'm one of your colleagues at the School of Medicine, one of yes. your faculty colleagues. And um, I'll talk to you later. My children are evolutionary biologists also. I think you Excellent. know one of them well, Al Alex Gunderson. But I wanted to know what the contribution of each of the institutions is to the center. Is it equal for, for WashU versus the zoo versus botanical gardens? You mean the financial? Yeah, financial underpinnings of it. The, uh, the actual finances came entirely from Washington University. Uh, however, the zoo, when the, when the sales tax passed in last November, that provided them with a lot more resources, some of which they devoted towards developing programs that are essentially part of what we're doing. Great. Uh, so that's, yeah, but and of course, they, they're providing a lot of in-kind services as well as allowing you know, the time of their staff and uh, increasingly having our students working with them there. So is this a long-term commitment of all three institutions then? Well, we have a memorandum of understanding. Initially, it's a five-year commitment with uh, very vague language about what happens after five years. Uh, I think it remains to be seen. Um, it, you know, that as the director of the, of the center, which is now two years old, I'm thinking, well, three years from now, what happens? I'm hoping that we can get enough done to at least make the case that this has been worthwhile. Sure. I think it's a great initiative. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, we've had good experience with the Environmental Law Center. Is that one of the departments or areas you're working with? I have, so I have met with the new director of the Environmental Law Center, and we're looking for where there might, where there would be overlap. But their efforts, mostly these days, are not specifically about biodiversity, but obviously we're in the same sphere. So I'd love to, to work with them. The other question is, uh, what would be the, the related population of living beings compared to non-living beings? And is there a further breakdown on Earth and in the, and in the water? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. The, well, the, the, whatever the classification term for non-living beings. You Min mean like extinct? No, like minerals and so on? Yes. It, that, that interaction of the diversity with, with the, the world in which living beings, the non-living world in which the living beings exist. What? I'm not sure how to quantify it, but there's certainly a field of research that understands how, uh, how the cycle of minerals and chemicals in the air interacts with the living world and how you know, it, it goes back and forth that living organisms, of course, made of, of minerals and so on that then get recycled and changed around. And, that, and it's very important because, for example, in the oceans, the oceans are getting more acidic due to carbon dioxide in the air and other reasons which affects uh, the many animals that have shells, which build those shells out of cal calcium that they extract from the water. But as it gets more acidic, chemical reactions change, and it's much harder for them to get the calcium. So the interactions, in and of course, what's happening with carbon dioxide, uh, you know, trees suck it up. And anyway, this is a hugely important area. Yeah. It, well, but, and then particularly in the specialty of urban uh, well, Yes, that, there's a lot of research on that. My colleague. Uh, St. Louis University is really looking at how stuff gets into streams 
from runoff from salt and many other chemicals, and then how that impacts the living organisms there. Yeah, my question was probably related to that, and you mentioned the law school also. Uh, to, to what extent do regulations and laws help you or hurt you in what you're trying to accomplish with this uh, nationwide, worldwide? Uh, it, it seems like it's a big part of the picture as to how are you going to succeed or not succeed in many of these projects? Well, I, the laws have all kinds of impacts in various ways. Uh, you know, the United States was a world leader in the Endangered Species Act, and that really led the way to preserving a lot of uh, a lot of species and their environments. And in many other ways, the Clean Water Act and so on. So, in those ways, those regulatory changes uh, have been hugely important. On the other hand, there are laws that regulate all kinds of things about how how we do research, how, what you can do with organisms, and so on. Uh, one of the things that's a little difficult at times is increasingly foreign countries make it, uh, scientists are easy to regulate. We play by the rules and we're very visible and uh, they, they can make it very difficult to do the research that's sometimes critically necessary. And one of the things that always has, you know, as an example from my own research, the in the Bahamas to get a permit to, to bring 100 lizards back to the U.S. for research is really difficult. Now, these are lizards. 100 lizards could live in a room this big. I mean, they're extraordinarily abundant. But it, they regulate that very, in a very difficult way. Meanwhile, people are tearing, are building new houses and new buildings willy-nilly with no concern about the much greater impact on the environment those people are doing. So, you know, it can cut, it can cut both ways. What kind of efforts are, do you know of that are um, being done, say, in Madagascar and in the Amazon, work with their governments to maybe repopulate the forests of the Amazon or return re some of that farmland back into forest and, and educate them into what kind of um, effect that that has on it and, and how they can help make it better? Well, lots of conservation groups are doing just that, that there's certainly a clear recognition that we can't impose our will on other countries, that, that, you know, that they have to want to do that. And both the zoo and the botanical garden work around the world, and they certainly work with governments as much as possible. So that is certainly true. And I, I would add as well that uh, both the garden and the zoo have worked very hard, as well as people here at the university, to train local people at all levels, from uh, just people living there to bring them here for advanced education, so that they can they can do the work themselves and take the lead, and that's been a major goal of uh, of all these institutions. And I should also have a sh make a shout out for the University for UMSL's Whitney Harris Ecology Center, which has been a world leader in training tropical biologists from around the world. So that's certainly very important. Um, of course, the, the flip side of that is, is we're dependent on the willingness of foreign governments to, uh, to want to do that. And Madagascar, sadly, has had one coup after the next, and the last few governments have been pretty corrupt and more interested in exploiting their, uh, what they have for personal gain of an elite few than preserving, pre preserving nature. And of course, recently Brazil had a President Bolsonaro elected who sees uh, the Amazon rainforest as dollar signs. So, you know, we certainly try to work with governments, but we're also at the, uh, at the bait, uh, the mercy of what those governments are interested in doing. A lot of the focus seems to be on a specific species, and we talk about we talk about the eagle, we talk about these little frogs in Yosemite, things like that. But what about interspecies relationships and evolution? So uh, they're all interdependent. And what is your group doing to study uh, the effect of uh, you know decreasing one species on the impact on the other species? You know, lizards obviously insects, and then the insect population is being uh, affected and uh, so what, what studies are being done to look at interspecies relationships? Yeah, that, that's critically important. 
absolutely. And some of the projects that I didn't highlight them, maybe I should have uh, uh, tilted them more in that direction. But for example, the project in Ecuador with the rainforest is really looking at the different components of the rainforest and how they interact and uh, how, what role that plays in, in preserving nature. Another project in the biodiversity of the Caucasus uh, led by people at the Zoo and the Botanical Garden had the, the similar goal. And this Madagascar project really is very broadly based. And in fact, one of the things that we're very excited about it is that there are people here, uh, obviously lemurs, because that's what the zoo cares about. And they're also very charismatic. You can get people excited about lemurs. But we have in people interested in fish, in insects, in plants. Of course, the garden has had a major effort on the plants in Madagascar. But to study all of the components and their interactions is, is critically important. And moreover, as, as I mentioned with the lemurs, one conservation strategy has been to try to focus on preserving species that need, need a big area to live in with the idea is if you can, if you can save tigers, you're going to save everything else that lives in a tiger's uh, range. Uh, and so you need, to, you, but you need to understand what the dynamics are, not just the tigers, but everything else involved. So a long way of saying you're absolutely right in and and some of our efforts. Some are very species specific, but others are much broader more broadly based. OK, can I, I think that's the end of our talk. But could I have one more round of applause for Dr. Lassos? Thank you very much. <laughs>